kingdom come Father let your will be done on earth as in heaven right here in my heart on earth as in heaven right here in my heart welcome to church OCC welcome to those who are watching online we're so happy you're here God is good it is good to be in the house of the Lord we uh, made a, a plea and a, a cry to God a few weeks ago for the prodigals in our lives and uh, so as we sing this next song I just want to um, refresh that 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 prayer that those of us who have prodigals in our lives would um, would come alive through the eyes of man we seem there's so much we have lost as we look down the road where all the prodigals have walked and one by one the enemy has whispered lives and led them off as slaves but we know that you are god yours is the victory we know there is more to come that we may not yet see so with the faith you've given us we step into the valley unafraid mercy God of unrelenting love rescue every daughter bring us back the wayward sons and by your spirit breathe upon them show the world that you alone can save God now breathe oh breath of God breathe oh breath of God now breathe breathe oh breath of God now breathe oh breath of God breathe oh breath of God now breathe breathe oh breath of God now breathe oh breath of God God now breathe, breathe, oh breath of God now breathe, oh breath of God, breathe, oh breath of God now breathe. We call out to dry bones, come alive, come alive. We call out to dead hearts, come alive, come alive. alive. Breathe your breath of life, Lord. Breathe your breath of life. Mm, we build our hope on you, on you and you alone. No one else can save. Mm. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus 
his blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Sing that again. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. prophetic word comes we choose to receive that or not if if you feel like the lord is allowing that word to come into your heart just say amen thank you lord 
And we'll take another second or so here if there's anything else God might want to say to us, an admonition, a scripture, a thought. We just wait. Thank you, Jesus. The Spirit of the living God is calling his people to draw close, to be still and know his voice, to know his words, to walk closely, to draw near to him, to rest in him, to know that he is God, to know his character, to know that even in the storms of life, he is near mm-hmm. and he is your peace. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yep, if you can receive that word, just say amen. Yeah, God's heart. Right. Just take another second or two here. Amen. Thank you for being obedient to the Lord. We'll sing one final song. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. for us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all forgiven and if you've been redeemed then sing the song forever to the lamb and if you walk in freedom and if you bear his name we'll sing the song forever to the lamb
Lift your, lift your voice. Sing a song to him. It doesn't have to be this song. It can be any song. Sing the cry of your heart. He is holy. He is holy. He is holy. And he is worthy. thank you for today we thank you for your presence I just keep hearing where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom Jesus says I am the resurrection says come to me he is the way the truth and the life thank you Jesus anybody here that needs a healing touch I want you to take your hand and put it on that spot there's healing presence here today. There's a spirit of healing. Father, I just pray for healing right now. For everyone that needs a need that you would meet it today. I just release that healing touch right now in Jesus' name. You've given us all authority, Father. You've given us that gift of healing. And I just release it right now upon each and every one of your children today. You are the way. You are the truth. And you are the life. And we receive it right now in Jesus' name. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built upon the foundations of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Lord, I just praise you for this body of believers. God, I just praise you for how you have knit us together. I just thank you for this day. I thank you for what you have done, what you are doing, what you are about to do. I thank you that we all have a good future and a good hope in you, and we can trust you, God. We can trust you with every circumstance, with everything that you are leading us through and everything that you are leading us into. We just pray for um, the Lopushis, the missionaries of the week, um, and they're in Albania. And God, we just thank you that you are meeting all of their needs according to your riches and glory. God, we thank you that you are pouring out your spirit upon them, that you are moving through them, and God, that all, all of their needs are met, that they are sowing into the ground, and God, I thank you for just watering, and we thank you for harvest in Albania. In Jesus' name. Hey, give somebody a handshake or a fist bump or a hug or something, and then you can have a seat. And children are dismissed, by the way.
You can have a seat now, thank you. So good to have you all here. I mentioned last week that I really wanted to get the front row filled up and Shauna was the first one and you're gonna get a gas card for that. So if you want a gas card, be the first in the front row. And you drive all the way from where, River Falls or somewhere? Man, talk about a commitment, River Falls. Yeah. Oh, you're gonna move back, okay. Oh, well, that's... You're certainly welcome. Welcome to all of you, those of you that have been here a really long time, and those of you that are new, we're glad for all of you. Uh, the children that are ages three through third through fifth grade would be going that way now, and the rest are that way, in case there's any confusion about that. I would like you to look at your bulletin. Um, we wanna just announce a couple things. You can put the slides up, Chase, if you would. Uh, first thing while he's doing that is you will see a slip somewhat like this in your bulletin. And if you need a bulletin, our ushers have some, so we'll be glad to, does anybody need a bulletin? We'll be glad to get that to you. Oh, they're out, oh, how could that happen? Anyway, and uh, welcome to our online crowd too. So if you wanna text us something, you know our online crowd can interact with us during service, so if they really like something or don't like something, they can let us know. And the ones that don't like something, I throw those away. And then the ones that, <laughs> anyway, we are hoping to get some more fellowship going. And I'll tell you a really neat way that's on here. I'd love for everybody to sign this to everybody. It's just circle dinner for six. It is such an easy way to get together with other people. Give us your name and phone number and circle dinner for six. And over the next 30 days, all we're asking you to do is participate with two other couples or some other singles or whatever and just have dinner together and see what the Lord does meeting people. You could play a game, you could do whatever you like together. But let's, let's fill this out and put it in the, uh, we're gonna have communion so there'll be buckets there. You can put it in there and get to know some people. We, you know, there's an epidemic of loneliness today and we just really need to expand our horizons. And I'll just about guarantee you, the people you meet with, even if you don't know them, you're gonna love them, okay? All right, so up on the screen, um, uh, Faith Fellowship up in Luck has asked us to advertise something at Sconewood Retreat Center, which is Eureka Way. Um, I know if you go too far and hang a, a, a wrong turn, you're gonna go to a nudist camp, so don't do that. <laughs> so, uh, that's not Sconewood if you get there, okay? Just uh, yeah, check, check the gate, all right? Uh, okay, next slide if we could. Um, next Sunday, we're gonna have a water baptism. Um, for those, the way we do water baptism here, you don't have to take a class. I'm more than glad to give you instruction. But kind of like John the Baptist, we're just saying, if you've repented and received Jesus as your Savior, you need to be water baptized, whether you were baptized as an infant or not. I'm standing on that. That was your parents' faith. Now you need to make a step of your own faith. At the end of service next week, we'll have our baptistry set up. We've already got some people signed up. Love to do that for you. It's a powerful day. In fact, it's, a, it's my favorite time is water baptism. John Brown is in the congregation. Wow, good to have you, brother. Yeah, from your travels afar. Yeah, praise the Lord. Uh, and then, uh, so that's next. And what we do for water baptism, bring your own like pair of shorts and a shirt that's not revealing after you're wet. And then you get to see my cool swim trunks, which are killer. And uh, anyway, we'll, we'll do that. Okay, next slide. And a towel, you need a towel. Thank you to all that helped yesterday. We got a lot of work done. We didn't get all the pictures of everybody, but we had everything from nursery toys washed to ferns being trimmed. And this whole, the new building has all the rock and stuff uh, laid out. Yeah, so 
I just, uh, yeah, Brian was really. <laughs> and then I'm going to have my wife, Kelly, come up. Would you grab the microphone for two reasons? She wants to share a little testimony that just happened. But also, if you could speak to some of your desires and hopes for breakaway. And you can't preach. Yeah, he says, I'm the, probably one of the people who can take a short story and make it really long. So, okay, I'm gonna, but I, I wanna do three parts. First of all, um, I wanna encourage you that the harvest is white. And I never realized it. So some of you don't know, so I was, I'm a retired teacher, retired two years ago, and then in April, I became a flight attendant. <laughs> and so I, I know, isn't it a shock? It is a shock because I'm 65, but yeah, so I'm a- I, I married an older woman, <laughs> if you guys know. If you're aware of that, I'm nowhere near that old. But I want you to know, every single time I get on a plane, I get to share the gospel. Every single time. I've got to pray with people, I've got to encourage people who are, are nominal in their faith, and I've got to, you know, it's just been amazing. So here's, so that's part one. The harvest is white. Just open your eyes because it's crazy. Okay, second part. So out of that, um, in school, the airline that I'm with, um, yeah, not good pay. So um, there was a young gal and she needed a place to stay. And so I said, come stay with us, we're empty nesters. Come stay with us. So she's been living with us since May. And she got a text yesterday that one of her friends was mauled by a grizzly bear yesterday in Montana. They had to do two flight for lives. Um, the grizzly bit him in the neck, in the back of the neck. It didn't get any arteries and they weren't sure about broken bones or what was going, going on. So she had brought um, a couple friends to help this young man's girlfriend out to where in Salt Lake City where he was in the hospital. And so I was talking with her this morning. You're not gonna believe this. They, they are discharging him today. They are discharging him to go. He, he's from Menominee and they're saying it's just a miracle. It is a miracle that God yeah. touched this young man. We had people praying, different people praying, and we just, no matter what, sometimes tough times come, but God is good. Amen. God doesn't take things away from us. He's only good. Sometimes we can't see why things are happening, but God is good. Always. And he has been good to that young man. Amen. And would you please pray for me that when, when I get out there, you know, amongst people, one lady said to me, she says, I don't know why a passenger, I don't know why I'm telling you all this. Mm. And I said, I do. I said, my husband and I pray together every night mm. and we're gonna pray for you. Mm -hmm. So her name's Virginia. I've been praying for, for her for two months now. Mm. Let God put you where he wants to put you and then open your eyes. Let, the, let be open to what the spirit is saying to you and look and see what he's doing and just don't try and make up something yourself. Just go to where he's working and he will use you. Hey, Kel, just, yes, you wanna. Oh yeah, last thing. So um, there's a thing and this is number three. Um, in Wisconsin, there's a law that says that you can pull um, children out of the public school during the school day for Bible classes. I bet you didn't know that. Mm. So we've been doing that for two years and we are going to be starting again this fall. We'll start in October. Um, it's called Breakaway. We do it at St. Cray Falls on Wednesdays and we've been doing it um, here in Osceola on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And um, if you are interested in helping, that would be great. Um, but what we're hoping to do it, this year is move it to Osceola one day and 
do the middle school and then add on the intermediate school. So we'd have third through eighth grade. So mm -hmm. it would be the morning we would continue doing the middle school and then the afternoon we would do the intermediate school. They, the best thing is they can't say no. The law says they can't say no. They, it's a miracle. It is a miracle. And it's totally non-denominational. It is Bible-based. Um, we use school ministries. We use their curriculum. The kids learn so much. It's, mm -hmm. it's wonderful. So would you please pray for Breakaway? Mm -hmm. And um, come see me afterwards if you are interested in helping. So it would be one day. One day. Okay? Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Yeah. Amen. Very good, thank you. We are in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. We've been there quite a while. It's such a wonderful, wonderful chapter. And actually, if you have a bulletin, you can be reading together with me in the same version I'm reading. But before we read that together, I wanna to read it out loud, right out of your bulletin. Hebrews 11, 24 to 28. I wanna tell you something. We all here are rebels at heart. All of us are rebels at heart. Um, sometimes that's good and sometimes it's not. Everything from a child not wanting to clean their room to someone going excessively over to the speed limit uh, to someone who won't drink Bud Light anymore. <laughs> rebellion's all over the joint, you know. But there can be a good rebellion, and I want to talk about that today. So um, can you read with me? I love reading out loud these verses. Uh, scripture is so powerful. Starting in verse 24, where it says, By faith Moses, you want to help? By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. And by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. May God bless his word. If you're in your Bible, I'm actually going to back up two verses behind that that we didn't read because I want to give you a little bit of background to this rebellion that Moses led that was very successful. And here's the most important part. It was God-ordained. God-ordained rebellion works and it sets people free. Um, by the way, the most famous person on the planet led a God-ordained rebellion. What was his name? Jesus. That's right. Jesus Christ. So I'm just going to back up a couple verses. Uh, if you look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 22, if you can find that. It says, By faith Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. This is hundreds of years before it happened. Hundreds of years. Joseph is a prophet. And he said, at, uh, when he was near death, he spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instruction about his bones. The reason that the Israelites were in Egypt, you might remember, is because there was a drought up in the land that, where Israel is today, in the chosen land, and they went down there to get food because Joseph, Jacob's son, was in charge. And it was a very good 70 years while they had their flocks there, and that Pharaoh was good to them. But over time, it got to be a really bad situation where it was out and out slavery. And eventually, the Jewish people, they grew prolifically. It's like guppies in a tank, man. They just kept getting more and more and more. And they were reduced to harsh labor to build cities for Pharaoh. I don't know if they built any of the pyramids, but they sh for sure built entire cities for Pharaoh. And they were responsible for making the brick. What a horrible, how'd you like to get up? And, what are you doing today, honey? Well, I'm making brick. Just like I have the past 40 years, you know, and they're in the mud and the muck and making these bricks so that Pharaoh could have a city, often dedicated to gods that Jewish people didn't believe in. So it was a kind of a form of idolatry. They hated it more and more and more, and of course began to cry out. They were in Egypt for a total of 400 years. 
Joseph knew this would happen because of a promise um, given to Abraham like way back in Genesis 12 when God made kind of a covenant with uh, Abraham and it said that Abraham fell asleep and this is when some animal pieces had been separated and God through a flaming torch walked right through that dreadful darkness came on him and the Lord spoke to Abram visionarily, know for certain for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. They will be enslaved and mistreated there. If you've read the Bible, Egypt stands overall for a bad place to be. Now temporarily, um, Abraham went there when there was a drought in his life. And Isaac went there when there was a drought. Uh, obviously Jacob went there and died there. Even Jesus went there to get away from a bad, you know, leader in Rome. But symbolically, Egypt is always a bad place to stay. And Egypt, uh, in New Testament terms, stands for the world that we're supposed to leave behind. The world, its system, and its way of doing things. So if you are a born-again Christian today, you have come out of your personal Egypt. Here's some verse, uh, verses from Hosea. It says, out of Egypt, I did what? I called my son. And that's what God has done. And it's, this is for daughters too, but he, it says that out of Egypt, out of this place of oppression and evil, God calls us out to a new existence. Now, sometimes you go through a wilderness before you, you know, get to your promised land. But God did allow his people to suffer so that he could prove to them who he was and what his desire was. And so at the burning bush, maybe you remember, Moses uh, had been raised up. He was a Jew, but he had been raised up in the uh, Pharaoh's household and trained well. Um, fled Egypt because he believed the people of God should be free. His first attempt didn't work and tried to do it on his own. And then 40 years later, God encounters him at 80 years old in a burning bush. And the Lord said, I've seen the misery of my people in Egypt. This is out of Exodus 3. I've heard them crying because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, uh, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, all the ites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are treating them. Uh, so now go, I'm sending you uh, to Pharaoh to bring my people out. And it's interesting, usually, almost every time God sends Pharaoh or reminds him what it's about, he says, even when he talks to Pharaoh, I'm bringing my people out so that they can do what? Worship me. It wasn't just freedom for freedom's sake, because that is freedom without a purpose. By the way, if you worshiped God today, you found purpose. Yep. If you just looked around and watched others worship God, you found nothing other than good examples. But if you worship God today, you found your purpose. What do you think eternity is going to be like? It's going to be worshiping God and responding to him in obedience, right? So you had over a million Jewish people under slavery. Moses is being sent. If you've uh, read Exodus or see, seen the Charlton Heston movie, you know that <laughs> Moses went in and he challenged Pharaoh ten times with various plagues and diseases and God was showing himself strong each time. And finally the tenth time, the land of Egypt was so decimated and the tenth uh, issue actually took the firstborn son out of every family that didn't have blood on the doorposts. And uh, Pharaoh couldn't take it. And the people said, get rid of these people. And so the Jewish people left with back wages for, I'm getting a little ring up here, Tyler, if you can deal with that. Back wages for almost 400 years. Do you think God is faithful? Yeah. Even if you got a jerk boss, he'll take care of you. He will. So back wages, their carts were loaded with everything they needed to build the tabernacle and more, right? There was gold and there was silver and there was bronze and there was jewels and everything they needed in carts. They just went out wealthy and decimated basically Egypt uh, as they left. But you need to get this. All of this was controlled by God and prophesied ahead of time. And truthfully, if we're going to get involved in something, 
if we're going to get involved in anything that has great value with rebellion connected to it, we better be sure God spoke about it first. Because, and we're not, I'm not talking little things here, and I think there are valuable things to rebel against today. But we better have the support of God's word. Because rebellion's in our heart, and some of our rebellion is not very godly and not directed by the Lord. By the way, when they left Egypt uh, to go through the wilderness to the promised land, Joseph's bones went with them, and they buried them after the 40 years in the wilderness in the promised land. So Joseph had his wish come true. Second thing we need to know is that rebellion started way before Moses through his own parents. So there had been a lot of uh, persecution against the Jewish people and slavery. And uh, if you've read Exodus through, Pharaoh was so afraid of the growth of the Jewish people that he commanded that every Jewish boy be murdered. Wow. And so he would tell the uh, midwives, okay, when that baby comes out, if it's a girl, keep with mom, but whisk away the boys and see that they get killed. And nobody knows how many boys were killed, um, but we do know what happened to Moses, and that's actually the, the next verse in Hebrews 11. It says, verse 23, by faith Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. So the rebellion that was going to rise up 80 years later started with his parents. Something to say about that. Um, the family unit is the core of all God does. You know, he didn't start a business in Genesis 1 and 2. He didn't even start a church in Genesis 1 and 2. What did he start? He started a family. And family is core, right? And so... Family understands the value of children and fights for children. And what Moses' parents were doing was the right thing. They were disobeying government the right way. Well, kind of. For three months it worked, and Moses' mom saw, well, they're going to catch me, they're going to kill my baby, I've got to do something. She must have prayed, she got a creative idea, she put him in a... Uh, a little boat, like a, you know, a basket with reeds in it and stuff. Uh, Pharaoh's daughter was bathing. I'm thinking maybe she couldn't have children. Um, the Nile was flowing, and it just happened to flow past her. She may have pushed it that way. I don't know. But uh, end result being that she saw the baby, and the Egyptian people really believed the gods were with the Nile, that it was a sacred river. So she saw it as a baby from the gods. Then what happened, very interesting, talk about God being in control. Moses' sister watched this go on and ran up. So this woman, oh, no, I got a baby. It's wonderful. I'm going to raise him up. She says, by the way, I know a lady that's lactating right now. Now, some of you guys need to look that up. What it means, <laughs> and no, men can't lactate. Hello. Dear God in heaven. Put Anyway, so, so, so Moses' uh, daughter says, cool, let's have the baby get nursed, and it'll be a healthy baby, and then when it's done being weaned, then, you know, we'll bring the child into Pharaoh's school, and he'll be like a great man someday, and he did become that. But guess when the most important years of a child's life are anyway? The first few years, and I bet she weaned him a long time, just so she could teach him more Bible. You know, so I don't know how old the kid was before he got submitted to Pharaoh's daughter, but he got all that Bible pumped into him and, and love and care, and his mother got to be with him the first few years of his life. And then he got the best, the Harvard-level training out of the planet Moses got under Pharaoh, a very rich man and a very wealthy society. It was opulent, okay? So that was Moses up for 40 years, and so this rebellion was already in his heart. God was doing something in Moses' heart. When he was 40, he couldn't take it anymore. His mother had pumped something into him about freedom, I'm sure. And Moses tries to set the people free by killing one soldier, and it just wasn't done God's way. Not God's time, God's way, right? That's when it works, okay? So this was uh, something that the family kind of built into Moses' life. And uh, perhaps you've had a, you know, a godly um, raising where your mom and dad taught you right and wrong and how to listen to the Holy Spirit, how to obey biblical truth. 
and I hope those become part of any rebellion that you will either start or be a part of. Okay? God-ordained rebellion works. It conquers fear, um, but it also costs. So we'll get to that in a minute. So finally, the verses we read was that Moses led this rebellion. He was God's man, and he tried to talk his way out of that. Um, you know, it wasn't like Moses was saying, God, use me, use me. Moses was just sort of happy being a shepherd and didn't think much of his life. And God built him up as he's good doing, so good to do. And he said, listen, Moses, I want to send you to release my people. And uh, that's exactly what happened. Um, to, to do what God called him to do required Moses making a choice about his lifestyle. Let that sink in. Moses could not set the people of God free and have the opulence of Egypt at the same time. I will tell you, wealth will destroy us if we don't rule it. Because pretty soon we're saying, hold it, I think God is calling me here, but I'll have to give up this. I'll have to do without this. I'll have to move and move, leave this nice home and community I'm a part of. And so those things get in the way of the will of God. And there's nothing that should get in the way of the will of God for you. Those things are idols if you don't lay them down, right? Um, and it can be very, very painful. So imagine Moses, you know, turning 40 years old. He's had the best the world has to offer. I mean, he just had everything and was looked up to, um, a man of high status. And I will tell you what he was doing for a Jewish man was likely sinful. That there were certain parts of his lifestyle that were inconsistent with a godly lifestyle. And he had to lay that all aside. I don't know what those things might have been, but usually when you're involved in high positions like that, um, you bend the rules a little bit. And uh, Moses had to decide, am I going to leave all this behind to pursue God? The second thing was he had to except the fact that he would likely suffer once he, once he left his family and actually became kind of a voice against his family because his family was keeping people in bondage. So when he, when he left Egypt, um, up until the time he left, he was a favored son. Then he was gone. Pharaoh, the Pharaoh that he was under didn't like him anymore. And then he didn't know what he was going to face when he came back. And what he faced was really harsh treatment. And that's why it says in Hebrews here, he... he he said, uh, verse 24, um, verse 25, he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather to, than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a short time. And boy, we all face that, don't we? About, um, you know, because let's face it, the people of God can be weird sometimes, you know. And to say I'm part of them is to say I'm weird like them, you know. But what, what else do you have? You gonna find this at the Elks Club or the bar? Where are you gonna get life and truth and hope for the future? Yeah. So Moses had to choose that, and the burning bush incident convinced him that he had to bring God's truth to his society. That was God ordained rebellion. He led a rebellion of the biggest kind. Now, I could go on and on about that, but I mean, you guys read your Bibles, and I hope you are aware of all that Moses went through, not only in Egypt, challenging Pharaoh, but 40 years in the wilderness, having the people of God complain against his leadership was very hard. And the sermon-based Bible study that we have available by the office or I send online deals a little bit with that. I believe that Moses sinned and lost some of his benefit because the cost got very high. The cost got very high. And that's one of the dangers of rebellion. You know, when we already know we have rebellion, we're born with it. We have rebellion in our heart, and most of it is not godly. We have to challenge every rebellious thought. That thing's got to be crucified or laid at the altar of Jesus and say, is this something, if I'm going to fight this, is God ordaining it? Am I going to stand against a system that is doing evil? Is God telling me to do that? Because here's something I believe. However you look at these scriptures, Christians, I believe, are called to be good citizens. 
they are. We should be model citizens wherever we can, right? To, to be upright and godly and beyond reproach in every way. Um, and that includes paying taxes. And let me just mention that a minute. Um, all of us pay taxes to a government that sends money, some of it, places that we don't agree with, right? I personally would not be against your rebellion not paying taxes, okay? I'm not against that. And many of you are paying the taxes in derision, right? You have chosen to pay them anyway, and that's okay too. I will tell you it's okay to rebel against that and not pay taxes. In God's, I really, I, I don't see the big sin if it's going somewhere. You, however, there will be a cost. And you've got to know that going in. Every rebellion has a cost. And whatever that cost is, you've got to know um, you're going to pay it if you become part of it. And I think a lot of us think just because we're saved, we're not going to pay the cost. Well, don't pay your taxes long enough, and you will. There may be a better way to challenge that through voting and running for office and that kind of a thing. Um, but that's something we all face. We're Christians. We understand this stuff, you know, that we're in a very imperfect world. So count the cost. If you do choose to rebel against authorities in your life, stop first and count the cost. Listen to Jesus. By the way, biggest rebel in history, Jesus Christ, did he pay a cost? cost him to challenge the man. It sure did. He says, suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he'll send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and ask for terms of peace. In other words, he'll find another way. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. And that's a segue into part two of this. It's always wrong to rebel if you do it for personal gain. There's a higher purpose than personal gain. In fact, I've already told you, if it's God-ordained, there will be personal cost. There certainly was to Moses. He did the right rebellion. He did the right thing. And there are things today that are worth rebelling against. There really are. And God may be sending you or us together. But we've got to know, first of all, it's going to cost us. And secondly... And I don't have, I'm not finishing this with some new idea for rebellion right now. I do have a direction in a moment, but it's probably not what you're thinking. It's going to cost whoever's a part of that, you know, rebellion. And we better be checking our hearts that it's not about personal gain. Because God won't be in it. Jesus said, unless you die to yourself, lay it all down, you can't even be my disciple. So it can't be for personal gain. It's got to be, got to be for something much bigger, and it's got, to bring, it's got to bring God glory. Many of us lived through the Vietnam era, some of us, and uh, there were several things about the 60s that were um, positive. Okay, so people, young people in particular, demonstrated, and a lot of those demonstrations needed to happen. There was corruption in government. There was a war that shouldn't have been fought. There were civil rights being abused, and some of those demonstrations were fine. They were, they were, that's what you can do in America is tell your authorities we don't like it and we're demonstrating. However, <laughs> it went places it shouldn't have gone. And that's where the trouble, that's where God stepped out of it. You know what I'm saying? When we, when, uh, well, let's face it, the sexual revolution came out of all that. They just threw care to the wind. They um, attacked authorities, became violent and, and all those other things. And I think we're still suffering some of the repercussions of the 60s and some of the rebellion, um, it basically became sin. So here's where I want to go as a final kind of statement here. I want to start a rebellion, a huge rebellion, and it's a rebellion against sin. I want to be a part of a rebellion that dispels darkness and evil. I want to see darkness leaves people's lives and light to come in. And I want to be, and I hope you do too, representative of that enough to be able to share with people, right? So we have darkness out there. People are deceived. They don't know. I mean, everything that we're reading about comes out of, I think, deception. People have no idea the de stupid decisions that are being made that are destructive to their future. 
and the future of our, our you know, this, that whole tune in, turn on, drop out kind of thing. Somehow, that was stupid in the 60s. That was Timothy Leary inspired by drugs. That somehow is carried on to our generation today, that we, we just do it. We just do really weird and crazy things. But Jesus said, go into the world, not into the church, and preach the gospel. Hello. <laughs> go into the world and preach the gospel, teaching people to obey everything that I've told you, the whole New Testament, all that stuff, teaching them so they become disciples and baptizing them next Sunday at the end of service. When are we having baptism? Sunday. Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and lo, King James, I'll be with you always, even until the... So Jesus must be really with people that want to get the gospel out in a, a large variety of ways. Let me finish with something that John wrote in 1 John chapter 2. This world that God loves enough to send his Son can capture our hearts enough to where we begin to love it more than him. And that's why John says, love not the world. Now, we love the people of the world, but not the systems of the world. Love neither the things of the world. If any man, any person, man, woman, child, loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. However, this world is passing away, and the lusts thereof, the desires for evil, he that does the will of God abides forever. Amen. I'm reminded that when Mary, I believe uh, Jesus' mother Mary and Joseph probably had died, but some of the boys were a bit concerned about Jesus. Like, he's not eating, and people are around him all the time, and we, we just don't know what's going to happen. And they tried to go see Jesus. You can read it. I think it's in Mark 6. He says, and they said, hey, Jesus, your mom's outside. Like he's supposed to quit preaching and healing and run and see her. And that's how we think. But he says, they that do the will of God are my mother and my brothers and sister. I, I, I don't think he went out and talked to her. Partially because her intent, the blessed mother, the blessed mother's intent. She was a sinner, by the way. You can, you can count on that. If she's in heaven, she had to get saved to get there. And I believe she will be. Boy, us Catholics struggle with that. I know. Yeah. This woman had fleshly desires for Jesus' life and had the brothers there as a posse to rescue him from what he was called to do. And your family may try that as well. But if you do the will of God, you'll abide forever. Boy, is that a good promise. Do you know that God wants you in heaven with him for the rest of eternity? He's doing everything possible to reach your heart and to keep you solid and to convince you that certain pathways and lifestyles are not life-giving and certain ones are. And you've got to deal with those lifestyles. I mean, I, again, thank God for his eternal life. But I'll tell you, life's going to be a lot better when we cooperate, right? Isn't, aren't we in a partnership with God? Don't we invite the Holy Spirit in and say, yeah, Holy Spirit, lead me today. Well, if he is, obey. Man, that's good news. And you're going to have a wonderful life. Amen? Amen? Yeah, let's pray a minute. I pray the Holy Spirit right now would just settle in to all of our hearts and bring that conviction um, that perhaps things we've been doing need to be repented of and turned away from. Words we say and thoughts we have and actions that we do that are not Christ-like, not kind, they're not uh, driven by mission, they have no eternal purpose. And, and those things drag us down, they weigh us down, the weight of sin. And right now, our Heavenly Father, because of all Jesus did on the cross, wants to forgive us. He wants to wash us clean and that's, that's true every day. I pray you would allow that grace to come in and just say, you know, Father, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm desiring to get that brand new start going again. And I need your power to overcome those sinful tendencies. And I, I pray, please, Jesus, you would just launch me afresh today. 
Let's just settle there a second. I want you to think about Jesus on his last night before he died, lifting up a piece of bread and a cup of wine and saying to his disciples, this bread is my body. Eat it in remembrance of me. And the same with the cup. He lifted up the cup. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Drink it until I return. And so we're about to do that through the communion elements. And perhaps those elements can seal the deal on your walk with Christ. Maybe this is your day to just completely dive in 100%. Maybe next week you want to get baptized. But the issue is you've got to start in your heart and say, Lord, I'm totally yours now. Do what you will with my life. All right? What we're going to do now, we, we have had the praise team come up in the past, but today we're just going to play some background music. Can you guys kind of turn the lights down? I think it's just a little easier to just get in the mood for this. Appreciate that. Yeah. just kind of feels like no eyes are on me. I'm just... <laughs> If you've given your life to Christ, you've got every right to do this. We have communion elements up here and back there. And you can just get a group of people together. Maybe you want to do it as a couple or a family or a couple families together. Just ask if there's any prayer requests in your group. And just pray. And if you just want to say, hey, I'm really making a commitment today, would you pray for me? And let that group pray for you. It's just your brothers and sisters in Christ. They all have the power of God in them. They love you. And when you're done, and the, uh, there's buckets there for your offering and those communication cards or anything you want to put in there, um, do that. And when you're done uh, with communion, we're done. Okay? It just I would ask you that uh, for those that are having communion, we just wouldn't talk too much in here until everybody's done with their communion. Okay, Lord bless you. Let's have communion together and have a great day.